Okay, thank you. Right, so uh, thanks for the uh, for the invitation. So unfortunately, it's a bit of a, a hectic period, and uh, I'm it's it's teaching term here, so I, I couldn't join uh, uh, join in person. But uh, yeah, so fortunately, we are in the you know remote uh, video conference here, so I can I, I have the chance to 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 give this talk remotely. Um, so let me see. Uh, I I. When preparing this talk, I try to, uh, let's say, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about multiband gravitational wave astrophysics and with a particular uh, focus on how, let's say, the lunar gravitational wave antenna uh, fits in the landscape of, uh, of multiband uh, multi astronomy. So I will, uh, I will uh, frame this in the, in the, let's say, context of the future of gravitational wave detectors. So I will mostly talk about LISA and 3G detectors, so these in space and 3G detectors in on the ground, just setting the stage for the you know what will be the future of GW astronomy. And uh, I will just then talk about how LGWA is gonna feel, uh, you know, in potentially feel the uh, the this year's gap between uh, uh, 3G and LISA, and uh, or and and then uh, you know talk about what are the possible multiband synergies. With the two, so we both with 3G detectors and uh, and with Lisa. Okay, so in order, um, so to start, I'm just showing this uh, this cartoon here, which essentially represents the distribution of uh, you know black holes, astrophysical black holes that you know in the universe, in a sense, right? So um, you see the uh, at you know. Stellar mass scales, so you have the stellar origin black holes. These are black holes that are born as, uh, uh, as, a, as the outcome of the, the end of the lifetime of, of massive stars. And the blue distribution here is the distribution of uh, supermassive uh, black holes that are seen in the center of galaxies. And, uh, you know, you have this, this gap, let's say, between the two. This is the realm of uh, the intermediate mass black holes where, you know, there are scarce observations, but, you know, a number of hints that, that these uh, systems should also, uh, should also exist. Most notably also because, you know, it's very hard to explain the existence of uh, black holes of millions to billions solar masses without starting with something that is smaller and then growing it in time. Okay, so we also expect that the so-called seeds of these supermassive black holes that we see in massive galaxy today come from, uh, you know, ever mass in the intermediate mass regime, perhaps. Okay, so you know that when these black holes pair in binary, they form uh, uh, massive black hole binaries. And what you see here in the top uh, left, in the top right, is a you know is a cartoon of the signal of them from a massive black hole binary. So you see the two black holes firing together, emitting gravitational wave, losing energy, and then merging in a single object that then relaxes into into a Kerr black hole. Now uh, the typical frequency and amplitude of this process of this you know gravitational wave emitted by a binary of black holes let's say can be easily scaled across uh, uh, with the mass right and so one can just make a very simple heuristic scaling to find out that the typical amplitude of the of a gravitational wave uh, let's say at merger is proportional to the mass of the system and inversely proportional to the distance obviously uh, but also the frequency is inversely proportional to the mass, okay? And this uh, is interesting because, of course, it sets the frequency scale that is of interest for a specific uh, astrophysical systems, right? And you see right away that if you want to detect solar mass binaries, uh, you need to look at kilohertz frequency. But if you want to detect more massive binaries, you have to go lower in frequency, right? And... You know, you can compare these frequency ranges with, uh, you know, the sensitivity of instruments that, you know, are at the present and would be in the future uh, covering, let's say, the gravitational wave landscape. Okay, so here you see essentially a sketch of the LIGO Virgo sensitivity, LISA, and uh, pulsar timing arrays, right? And you see this is on the frequency scale, and uh, as uh, the frequency is inversely proportional to the mass, you can actually represent on this very same diagram the mass distribution of 
the systems that I showed you before. And you see essentially right away that, uh, you know, ground-based detectors are sensitive to stellar mass object and perhaps intermediate mass. Uh, LISA is mostly sensitive to massive black hole binaries. And here in between, right, is where the intermediate mass black hole sit. Okay. Right. So the only window that is open at the moment is this window here, the high frequency one. Okay. And uh, moreover, the sensitivity of the instruments is such that we cannot see objects at very high distances or a very high redshift, right? And so if I have to now add the redshift or distance dimension to the uh, to this to the picture, here I have on the x-axis the masses of uh, you know the our black astrophysical black holes. On the y-axis I have either redshift or distance. And essentially, you know, what we have detected so far are pretty much, well, a couple of neutron star binaries and mostly stellar origin black holes, the stellar mass black holes, uh, in the mass range 10 to 100 solar masses are actually lower than one, okay? But you see that there is a huge parameter space yet to be explored. So in the future, we will have probes that actually fill this uh, parameter space, in particular, 3G detectors on the ground, like Einstein Telescope and Cosmic Explorer. And you know, I'm not going to spend much time here, it's just framing the stage, right? So, but these detectors are going to observe black hole binaries up to Rashid 20, maybe you know, tens of thousands per year, uh, all neutron star binaries up to Rashid 2, 3. And perhaps, and some, you know, they will extend, uh, as you see here, they will extend the sensitivity to system in the intermediate mass regime between 1,000 and 10,000 solar masses. And they will allow a lot of uh, amazing science, right? We can, we will have a, you know, complete picture of the distribution of merging black holes in the universe. So we can reconstruct uh, possibly their astrophysical origin. We can learn about the physics of neutron star mergers and the physics of dense matter by looking at the actual signal at the merger of neutron star binaries, uh, we might be able to do multi-messenger astronomy with many sources. So a lot of uh, uh, you know expectations lie in these uh, 3G uh, detectors. On the other end, at the lower frequency, we will have LISA, the last interferometer space antenna, which is a ESA-led uh, mission. And you see the, uh, the, the, the cartoon here with the constellation orbiting around the sun trailing the earth in this cartwheel configuration. Um, the arm length is uh, 2.5 million kilometers, and this makes it sensitive to the Milliers regime, where there is, which is expected to be the uh, window, which is the most, uh, uh, the, the richest in terms of astrophysical sources. You will expect there, you know, uh, millions of binaries in our galaxy, like neutron star, bi uh, mostly white world binaries, but also neutron star black hole binaries, supermassive black hole binaries merging pretty much everywhere in the universe, uh, extreme acceleration spirals, the early spiral of the systems that we see in the LIGO Virgo band. So stellar mass black hole coming, uh, you know, in the local universe, let's say. So this is just the one, you know, I, if I put the laser sensitivity on the plot that I showed you before, uh, those are the contour plot in sensitivity of the li of, with which Lisa will see a mass, a binary with a given mass at the given redshift. And you see that essentially Lisa will see every massive black hole binary merging between, you know, a few thousand to a few million solar masses up to redshift 20 and beyond. So, and those gravitational wave instruments are not really directional, right? So you will see every single merger of these objects in the universe. And uh, with this, uh, you know, by detecting this object, we will have, uh, uh, we will uh, try to understand what is their uh, origin. So what is the nature of their seeds and their mass? So for example, it's unknown whether these massive black hole binaries, start, whether the massive black holes start already quite massive, like you know, hundreds of thousands of solar masses, like in the blue track here. Each track here is the evolution of a, you know, massive black hole. Or if they start light, maybe in the hundreds of solar masses, right? And depending on, uh, you know, the properties of the uh, gas and the content of H2 in the early universe, um, 
you know, you will have, you can form a black holes of different sides. So you can form either low mass seeds or massive seeds or whatever that is in between. Okay. So this is essentially unknown and it's something that we can start try to pin down with gravitational wave observations. Those observations are also very much complementary to electromagnetic probes. So here you see again, uh, in gray is the uh, contour plot of the sensitivity of ELISA detector. Okay, so again, you see ELISA will see everything within, you know, between 10 to the 3, 10 to the 7 solar masses. Those green and uh, orange areas are uh, essentially is the is the region where most of the massive black hole binary merger are expected to be for a heavy seed uh, scenario and for a light seed scenario. And this other purple area and these blue dots are essentially quasars. Okay, are the highest ratio quasars that are seen in the universe. So you see that our electromagnetic view of supermassive black hole and the gravitational wave view that you get with LISA are very much complementary. There is, of course, a nice overlap area where we expect to do multi-messenger astronomy, but really LISA will be complementary to electromagnetic probes in pin down the history of uh, uh, the, the evolution of massive black holes in the universe. Um, so let me just uh, skip a little bit ahead uh, in the interest of time, because I want to concentrate on the multiband part. So one of the things that you can do with LISA that was realized uh, right after the first detections of uh, uh, by LIGO and Virgo is that, uh, you know, it might be the case that massive, uh, you know, stellar mass binary black holes, but still, but quite massive, like 30, 40, 50 solar masses, um, you know, if you track them back a few years before merger, they land in the LISA band. So this opens the, the, the possibility of multiband astronomy in the sense that, you know, there would be systems that are seen, can be seen by LISA before merger, and then they will cross to the ground-based detector bands and can be seen in the, uh, in the ground-based detectors as well, okay? So those, so this possibility opened the, let's say, field of uh, the so-called multiband uh, gravitational wave astronomy. And uh, it is interesting for a number of reasons, right? So, um, for example, uh, well, you can send alerts to ground-based detectors, right? If you have a detection uh, from space of a signal that, uh, you know, will merge within a few years, then you can alert uh, ground-based detector, and they will know exactly when and where to look for a signal, which makes, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, easier to detect the signal. Uh, uh, it prevents uh, detectors from being shut down in the case that there is a specific, you know, a specifically interesting signal to look at. Um, it can enhance multi-messenger astronomy because uh, detecting things at low frequency uh, with LISA will help pin them their sky location much better. And so you can really uh, enhance the prospects of doing multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, if you see a signal across frequency bands, uh, you can put stringent limit on deviation of GR within, within some uh, scalar tensor theory, for example. Um, but it's also interesting, and I will mostly maybe concentrate on this, for astrophysics and uh, cosmology. Uh, because uh, at low frequency, <clears throat> um, gravitational waves have not been still, uh, let's say, efficient in circularizing the orbits of the binaries. Uh, and therefore, it's much more likely that you can measure eccentricity at low frequency. And eccentricity, measurement of eccentricity is important because uh, it can help discriminating between uh, formation scenarios, because different formation scenarios for these binaries result in different eccentricity distributions. Moreover, you can use them to do uh, cosmologies, both as uh, standard sirens or uh, so-called uh, uh, dark sirens. And I will, you know, touch upon this uh, in the remind of, uh, of my talk. Now, LISA can in principle help in doing this multi-band multi astronomy, but it's not quite optimal for that because, you know, it's not being designed to be a multi-band, uh, let's say, instrument with ground-based detectors. And so this is where uh, LGWA in principle is gonna sit. And uh, what I'm showing here is essentially, you know, the, a, a zoom in of the plot of the, you know, gravitational wave landscape that I showed before that focuses on uh, the 
the ground based band here on the left, on the right, sorry, space band, space based band, Lisa on the right. And this is where LGWA is going to sit. And this is a sensitivity that I was given by Jan. So I presume it's up to date. And you see very interestingly that it really, the bucket, it really sits between, you know, space based and future 3G uh, detectors. So in principle, there is the potential for uh, a lot of synergies with both bands. So let me uh, then uh, uh, talk a little bit about those uh, uh, those synergies. Um, all right, so you can actually put LGWA on this mass redshift diagram. So this is the reach of, in red, you see the reach of 3G detectors. In uh, blue, there is the reach of uh, LISA. And uh, this red triangle uh, is uh, potentially, you know, the reach of uh, LG. WA, you know, I know that there are some of these uh, waterfall plots somewhere in uh, in the literature. I just, you know, I didn't have one. I just sketched more or less where the main area of interest is. Right, it's really between uh, the two, the two, and so you see there is a huge overlap with both bands. So a huge possibility of doing multi band uh, with uh, uh, ground based uh, and space based detectors. So let me have a look. Uh, for example, like ground based. Okay, so here, so let's look into this uh, in this circle. So clearly, any signal that you know, either black hole binaries or uh, like neutron star binaries that are seen from uh, the ground and that are going to be seen by 3G detector can be seen by uh, uh, LGWA earlier in the spiral. And this is important because even though this is a small portion of the signal compared maybe to the you know to what is seen in the uh, in, by ground based detectors, uh, we should consider we must consider the fact that the the the, the, the frequency evolution is uh, a steep function of the frequency. So the signal lives quite longer in band here. Okay, so for example, if you take a neutron star binary. Um, a neutron star binary is essentially one year from merger, pretty much uh, uh, around here at uh, you know 0 0.1, 0 0.2 hertz. Okay, so this small signal that I'm showing with my cursor here, which is a neutron star binary at 200 megaparsec, this small chunk of signal here is going to last one year. So it's going to be like one year in band for LGWA. This is a neutron star binary at 200 megaparsec. For uh, black hole binaries, like one year from merger is somewhere around, uh, you know, 0 0.02, 0 0.03 hertz here. So again, LGWA, LGWA will see black hole binary mergers uh, in spiraling in band uh, for several months. And this uh, track here is a black hole binary of 10 solar masses at a gigaparsec distance. Okay, so this I really drew by hand pretty much by eye, right? But, you know, the area below the signal here is the SNR. So, you know, I sort of estimated that uh, black hole binary of 10 mega, 10 solar masses at uh, a, a gigaparsec and uh, Newton star binary at 200 megaparsec is more or less the reach of this sensitivity curve, roughly speaking. Of course, there are, you know, it's much more complicated than that, but just for the sake of the argument. Then, for example, with LGWA, you can see this, you know, 10 solar mass binaries uh, up to gigaparsec. So the volume is about 5 gigaparsec. If you take a merger rate of 20 per year per gigaparsec cube, those are 100 per year. Or if you observe for 10 years, so this is a thousand of these black hole binaries. And, you know, of course, if you consider more massive black hole binaries, because we know that the mass distribution extends to 50, 60 solar masses and beyond, you know, those will be seen at redshift much larger than one, so you will see more of those. But still, let's consider just only these thousand, let's say, black hole binaries. Um, you can do a lot with multi-band multi astronomy. For example, you can combine LGWA and 3G parameter estimation, and because the signal lives a lot in LGWA, uh, it should give a very precise estimate of the chirp mass and the sky location. Whereas in 3G, since you have a high SNR, 
you know, it will give you a better estimate of the distance. But then this means that, uh, uh, you know, by combining the two, you will get the precise 3D localization of those systems. And so, for example, uh, you can do uh, cosmology very well. Let me skip here, sorry. Uh, I did the argument on the wrong way around. Okay, so let me, okay, let rewind. Rewind. <laughs> um, so first of all, you will see them at lower frequencies. So you can do astrophysics in a sense that you can measure much better with LGWA the eccentricity, right? And you will have measurement of eccentricity on thousands of these black hole binaries. And uh, this is a study that we did a while ago with Lisa. And well, essentially what you can take out of this is that, you know, with tens of detections, you can really pin down different uh, formation scenario, whether those are from the field or from uh, dynamical capture or whatever. So it's very interesting to have, uh, uh, um, you know, to, to look at this multi-messenger observ multi band observation in order to determine the evolution of these objects, especially if you combine the eccentricity information with the spin information that is going to come from 3G detectors. And in, if you go, uh, uh, if you talk about cosmology, this might also be very interesting because those thousand black hole binary, many of them will have a very precise sky localization and a very precise distance determination which means that you can use them as dark sirens. So essentially you can uh, infer uh, the redshift of the uh, host uh, with the statistical methods, essentially, by considering the galaxy distribution within the error box of the signal. And uh, the, this technique uh, is, gives you essentially a precision of the inference of the parameters with this, we see, which, which goes with square root of n, and this is based on some, you know, LISA study that we did a while ago. But in principle, with hundreds of these, uh, uh, with the precision that you can measure the parameters with LGWA, uh, you can get to sub percent precision cosmology with dark sirens, which is, uh, you know, quite remarkable. Of course, if you go to the neutron star binaries, uh, you know, at the with, with the typical with the same estimate that I did before, you can estimate that in ten years you might see hundreds of these neutron star binaries, and those you will again localize very well with LGWA and estimated distance with 3D G detectors, and really should be able to you sh we should be able to see the counterparts of every one of those or many of those, right? And therefore uh, be able to do precision cosmology with the uh, hundreds of standard sirens. So, which is a very interesting prospect. And this is enabled mostly by multiband astronomy with uh, between LGWA and ground-based detector. So let me spend my last few minutes on uh, the low frequency part. So the interact, the let's say synergy between LGWA and LISA. Now, LISA is a phenomenal instrument in the sense that can see black hole everywhere in the universe in the few thousand to few million solar mass range. However, as you can see here, circled here, if your seeds are light, right, uh, you're not going to see their mergers with LISA. Okay, so LISA is going to be blind to hundreds of solar mass binary mergers at high redshift. Well, this is where the synergy with uh, 3G and uh, LGWA come into play. Because already, you know, 3G will see merger of uh, stellar mass objects at high redshift. Um, but still, you know, there is a gap between the 3G uh, region and uh, the LISA region, right? So it's going to be kind of hard to, let's say, describe the overall population. To, to some extent, uh, you will have to, you know, you will observe things uh, in the under mass range with the 3G, you will observe things in maybe the 10,000 mass range with LISA, and then you will have to convince yourself or you will have to devise some statistical test in order to convince that you are seeing the same distribution. So those objects here are those objects over there that have grown up, and they're not to separate populations. Okay, but if you have L, uh, LGWA, then you can sample the whole population across mass and redshift. So really, 
you can reconstruct all the cosmic history and the evolution of these uh, massive black hole uh, binaries, okay? Uh, which is a very, very interesting prospect. So you see also that uh, um, if I go back here, um, interestingly, below 10 to the four solar masses. Alberto, yes. Five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> before the before the the 10 to the three, 10 to the four solar masses with Lisa, really you don't see the merger, right? The merger here, the green, the green, uh, the green lines, the merger is outside the Risa range. But you see that it's inside uh, LGWA. So really, LGWA will see the merger and rain down of uh, all the massive black holes at 10 to the 5, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 3 solar masses. Some, many of them are going to be inaccessible uh, by LISA. So really, you see here the potential synergy that you have uh, with LISA and with 3G in order to reconstruct completely with multiband observation the uh, massive black hole binary cosmic history. And uh, I think I will stop here. So um, essentially, LGWA will facilitate some exquisite multiband science by observing several thousands black hole binaries uh, and uh, hundreds of neutron star binaries jointly with uh, 3G detectors. Okay, this will, ena will, will enable really precision cosmology because uh, you will be able to uh, pin down the location of these sources. And you can do this also with dark sirens. Um, it will observe a seed massive black holes beyond these capabilities. And, uh, you know, and it will observe a lot of the parameter space of intermediate mass black holes and massive black holes jointly with, uh, with LISA. Um, so this will allow a lot of, uh, you know, astrophysics and, and cosmology, as I just said. So it's really, I think it's a really um, interesting and it's a really, uh, you know, compelling uh, science case for uh, having uh, a, you know, instrument that really sits here at the interface between uh, ground-based and space-based detectors. So I think I'll uh, stop here and uh, I will take any question. Thank you. Thanks, Alberto. Questions? Ah, uh, yeah, on top there. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. Um, so my question is related to the, these cracks of stellar mass black hole mergers, which, which start around um, frequencies greater than uh, 10 to the minus two. Mm -hmm. So my question is, why don't you see the earlier part of this in the LISA? Why do they start suddenly at uh, 10 to the minus two hertz? Or, uh, okay. um, no, man, I mean, you do. It's a matter of uh, signal to noise. So in fact, if you actually... I don't know if it's visible. If you if you look at this this population, you see different uh, things. So you see those very long uh, tracks, okay, and those are systems that you start to see in the Lisa band and cross to the LIGO band. But you also see all these uh, small ticks and dots, the blue ones here, okay. So these blue ones are essentially still uh, uh, black hole binaries that you see in the LISA band, and they are far enough from merger that will not cross significant, will not, you know, move significantly in frequency, and so will not be multiband source because will not cross to the uh, multi, to the, to the uh, ground-based detector. Uh, the problem is that at you, the lower you go in frequency, the lower is uh, uh, the SNR of these sources. So you, you really see them with SNR higher than eight, uh, only above, let's say, three milliards, and you know, with current estimates, we expect to see maybe tens of them with Lisa, not that many. All these other um, pale cyan uh, dots and lines that you see here are also stellar black mass black hole binaries, but they have individual SNR lower than eight. So those will not be resolvable in LISA and they will constitute an unresolved uh, uh, foreground that in principle is going to be detectable. 
Thank so you. I hope that answers the questions. Yeah, it does. Thanks. Oh, another question there. Oh, well, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, so maybe a bit related. So, but suppose you had a very bright uh, permanent source like a Lisa verification binary, which maybe is not known yet, right? But it's going to be detected maybe bright, uh, you no know, close double neutral star binary, which is both seen by Lisa and LGWA. So mm -hmm. the question is, can we learn something new about the source, about maybe the detectors themselves? Can we extract any other valuable science from say, seeing the same bright permanent source in the, the two detectors? Well, certainly, well, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, of course, if you see the same source uh, with two different detectors is uh, that you can verify the calibration of your detectors, right? Uh, so that's the, and that's, you know, that that's not uh, trivial because of course, calibrating detectors to better than uh, percent level uh, it's not it's not a trivial thing. I mean, we know that, for example, the, our ground-based detectors are not calibrated at the percent level. And uh, so in principle, if you see a persistent uh, uh, source in both bands, uh, the first thing that the, the first thing that you can do is uh, uh, verify that you understand <laughs> your your detectors and they you know they give you consistent uh, consistent measurements. Um, then of course, I mean, uh, one has to think a little bit about it. Of course, you you have a signal that uh, it's coming from. You, you have a signal that in two different detectors, the two different detectors have different pattern functions. Um, they will have different SNRs, so of course uh, you will get a better sky localization, a better distance determination. So in general, you will do a better estimate of the parameters. Um, but still, in that case, uh, you know you are seeing a same persistent signal with two detectors, with two gravitational wave detectors. So besides uh, calibrating them and besides uh, improving on the estimate of the parameters, I don't see, you know, on top of my head any specific uh, you know new science that you can do uh, compared to seeing it with one it's a very quick follow-up so i mean um can one exploit this parallax i mean the moon is here this is there so it's very big baseline to get very accurate distances uh i uh, i think so um actually yes so this is uh yeah this is a very good point and in fact if you have uh, the um in fact, uh, yes, I said something that is probably wrong because, uh, uh, in principle, you can combine if you combine coherently the signal from the two. Actually, the improvement, especially in the sky localization and the distance, it's much much higher than the improvement that you get by only let's say combining uh, by the fact that you enhance the SNR, right? And this has been uh, investigated, for example, for a network of interferometers like. Uh, Lisa and Tai Chi or Lisa and Tianqing, for example. In those, in this case, you can really uh, see that because, for example, Lisa Tai Chi, they are essentially the same instrument but separated by four degrees along the orbit of the Earth. So really, there you see the baseline enhancement and the sky localization accuracy that you get with two similar instruments with this large separation can be of the order of a thousand better. Um, so I presume a similar thing uh, you can do if you have uh, LGWA and LISA for uh, the same sources. So in principle, you can really get the sky localization uh, much, much better. But, you know, these are calculations that have to be done a bit carefully using whatever partner function this uh, LGWA is going to have, uh, this modulation of the signal, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, I, I presume there are people working on this. It might be very interesting, in fact. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, nice talk, uh, Alberto. I have a question regarding EMRIs. So EMRIs are uh, quite interesting sources for LISA, right? Yeah. Uh, is there any scope of observing EMRIs with LGWA? Uh, yes. So ma mass ratios? I didn't actually touch on this, but um, now let me see if we can use this plot. Um, but let's say maybe more than Emery's, uh, I would talk about uh, 
let's say emeralds, right? Because what you see here, this uh, this golden thing here. So this is an emery at because okay, the frequency of the emery is set by the mass of the central object. Okay, and here is a typical emery for a three hundred thousand solar mass central black hole. And this frequency here scales with the inverse of the mass. So if instead of 300,000, you have uh, 30,000, you have an order of magnitude higher frequency. So you see you are in the LGWA regime. Instead of having 30,000, you have 3,000, you really are exactly spot on at this frequency. So I think there's gonna be a talk by Paul tomorrow about the Emory or Emory's. I presume he will say, uh, much more about this. But yes, in principle, uh, emeries and emeries, let's say low mass light emeries or intermediate mass ratio in spirals really fall uh, in the realm of uh, um, LGWA. And, and, and probably LGWA is really the best uh, type of instrument for this, right? Because of course, these, uh, if the central object is a few thousand solar masses, you can't really, you know, it, it's really outside of the region for a 3G detector. And it's also, you know, too much high frequency, perhaps a bit too quiet for LISA, depending on the distance. So there is definitely scope of investigating the parameter space for emeries and emeries with HWA as well. Other questions? Uh, I have one, Alberto. I missed probably one of the when you were talking about multi band between LGWA and uh, EG detector about eccentricities. Which range of masses and uh, which range of eccentricity would we expect in the multi band analysis that you did? You performed? Okay, so in the in this uh, study that so this was a study that we did uh, a while ago when uh, you know the first detections were. Uh, were performed. So in this study, we took a, a standard, the mass function was the, whatever mass function was available at the time. So, but let's say consistent with uh, the, the LIGO measurements. And here uh, we just took, so this was a very idealized study where we took eccentricity distributions from, for three different uh, um, models, uh, formation models, formation scenarios. So we took um, uh, a field formation scenario, a cluster formation scenario, and a, let's say, Kozai lead of von uh, Zippel, if you want, formation scenario. So in the first scenario, you know, you have field stars that do what they have to do and they form binaries. Second scenario, you have mostly captures and exchanges in stellar cluster. The third scenarios, you have... Uh, a massive black hole and uh, a binary that is uh, driven eccentric by lead of Kozai oscillations. So we took from this model, so we had, there were papers by Antonini, by other people that predicted the distribution of eccentricities at formation of these different scenarios. So those distributions were different. And then we evolved this distribution of eccentricity, um, you know, forward from formation to merger. And that's the distribution of eccentricity that we talked, uh, uh, we talked, we we used in this uh, in this study. To be uh, to give you an idea of what you can measure, um, Lisa can measure eccentricities reliably down to uh, less than a part in a thousand. So it can measure eccentricity down to zero point zero zero one, and maybe slightly below. Um, so it might be that. Uh, uh, it might be that a detector that sits uh, in between, so at slightly higher frequency, it might be that it cannot measure the eccentricity down to that precision, down to that minimum value, maybe, you know, a few parts in a thousand, maybe. Uh, but still, you know, much, much better than uh, the minimum eccentricity that you can measure in ground-based detectors. So, so the, the key point, I think, that is the lower you go in frequency, uh, the smaller is the minimum eccentricity that you can measure. That's the that's the key point. And so and and sources are expected to be more eccentric. So you are really much more sensitive to eccentricity when you go yeah, to the I guess the ten to my one part on ten to four or five it was for emery, right? I mean like 
or which you expect eccentricity, which are very large? No, no, no. I mean, no, no. Also for binaries. I mean, what, what I mean is that if you have a binary that has eccentricity 0 0.0001, then uh, your measurement is going to be zero plus an error. Okay. You cannot really measure the eccentricity of 0 0.0001 with Lisa. But if your eccentricity is 0 0.001, then uh, you can measure it. You can tell that it's not zero, but it's 0 0.001. Okay, thanks. Okay. I hope that was clear. <laughs> Okay, I don't see other questions. So thanks a lot, Alberto, for being with us. Thank you for the for the invitation. Thanks again, and uh, you know, wish you. Uh, now I have to go with other because of other commitments, but I, you know, have a nice uh, rest of the workshop.